Pesach, the eighth day. As we've now crossed into sunset, today is the seventh day of the Omer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, ashir kitshanu bimitzvotah vitzivanu al sifrat ha-Omer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has commanded us to count down the Omer. Stunningly, in the non-Messianic Jewish community, the eighth day of Pesach is traditionally associated with our hopes for the coming of the Mashiach. As you saw from the readings tonight, the half Torah portion is Ezekiel 36 and Ezekiel 37, the dry bones chapter, where the Lord commands Ezekiel, speak to the bones, and the bones start to rattle, and the flesh and the sinew comes back. But it ends stunningly with the Ruach. We see the first the physical restoration, then we see the spiritual restoration when the wind of God blows and brings life back into Israel. The eighth day is referred to as the Feast of Mashiach. The prophet's vision of a serious defeat and return of the Jewish exiles to the land of Israel to usher in an era of peace and harmony is one of the most famous verses of another Messianic reading in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 12. It says, The wolf will dwell with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion, and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. A nursing child will play by a cobra's hole, and a weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. And they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Adonai as the waters cover the sea, verse 9. Verse 10, it will also come about in that day that the root of Jesse, Yeshai, will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will seek for him, and his resting place will be glorious. It will come about in that day that my Lord will again redeem a second time with his hand the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, from Egypt, Pathros, from Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Verse 12, he will lift up a banner for the nations and assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. This passage describes the Messianic kingdom and its Davidic king. Verse 12 is a one new man passage. Gentiles, the nations, the Goim, and Israel, and Judah. The combination of Israel and Judah reveal this passage as a reconciled kingdom, which has only occurred in our day. This has only been since May 14, 1948. Coupled with the inclusion of the Gentiles. In the beginning of this passage, what is a lamb, a kid, a young lion, a calf, a yearling, and an infant? When a scriptural passage goes out of its way to list by name specific animals, then there's, there's a critical mystery here that Adonai wants us to know and to understand. As we study this passage, we see a common denominator, a common thread regarding the specific creatures named. What do all these things have in common? A lamb, a kid, a young lion, a calf, yearling, an infant, or all young offspring, including the little child. This is a Lador of Ador reference, a generation to generation. The coming Messianic kingdom, the age of redemption, will be initiated and led by the next generation. This is Adonai's pattern that was and is established throughout the Passover Pesach story. The Exodus, the promised land story of the bad report and disobedience of 10 of the 12 spies. The other two, Yehoshua, a Jew, and Kalev, a Gentile, those two gave a good report. But the ten gave a bad report, which resulted in 40 years of wandering, 40 years of judgment in the wilderness, so that the generation that experienced slavery in Egypt would die before the next generation could enter into the promised land. In Numbers 14, verses 22, 23, and 32, and 33, it said, None of the people who saw my glory and the signs I did in Egypt and in the desert yet tested me these ten times and did not listen to my voice, will see the land I swore to give their ancestors. None of those who treated me with contempt will see it. It's easy to look back in hindsight and say, wow, they just had all those miracles. What's the problem? Yet, the Spirit is alive and well in our day today. Numbers 14, verses 32 and 33 says, But you, your carcasses will fall in the desert. And your children will wander about in the desert for 40 years, bearing the consequences of your prostitutions until the desert eats up your carcasses. Of those redeemed from slavery to freedom, only the next generation, the young people would enter in and take the promised land. 
That's another mystery here in Isaiah 11, in that the young people must lead with the blessings, the guidance, and the permission of the mature leadership, the previous generation, those with the gray hair, the lamb, the ewe, the kid, the baby goat, they may survive if the wolf and the leopard allow it. The previous older generation must allow the baton to be passed to the next. Entering the seventh and last day of matzah at sunset, the eighth day of the Pesach matzah festival, we begin to see a transition period. We're in a season of rebirth, of renewal from the old to the new. As we finish celebrating Pesach and matzah, we now prepare for the age of redemption, the Messianic reign, the Davidic kingdom. It's my duty, it's our job, it's our responsibility as Messianic congregations, as a Messianic movement, as Messianic rabbis and pastors, to not just teach the next generation, to not just include the next generation, Jew and Gentile with us, to not just prepare them and raise them up to lead. It's actually our destiny, our responsibility to begin the transition of passing the baton, the transition of the mantle of leadership from this generation to the next, la door of a door, as the opportunity arises. That's exactly the focus of this season. The timing is subjective, and it will vary Kehelet by Kehelet, tribe by tribe. But Isaiah 11 clearly points to the eighth day of Pesach as a moed, a set time to encourage, to make room, to set a place at the Pesach Seder table for the next generation of leaders. It's not easy. We must be right with that or not, humble, obedient, submitted, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, coming before him with clean hands and a pure heart. We must align ourselves with the entire word of Adonai and with correct spiritual authority of the land, which we have with Chief Anne. We must follow the correct biblical pattern from generation to generation, the door of the door. We witness the kingdom of God, Torah, Nevi'im, the prophets, the Helim, the Psalms, the Tanakh, even the Brehadashah, the New Testament, being passed from one generation to the next Adonai, in fact, commands us regarding the Shema, which we open every service with. Think about this prophetic decree. We start every Shabbat service with this. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7 says, These words which I'm ordering you today are to be on your heart. Yeshua talks about this. Deuteronomy talks about this. A, a circumcised heart where the word is actually on your heart. And you're to teach them carefully to your children. You're to talk about them when you sit at home, when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. This is directly connected to Pesach, to Matzah. Each and every generation is obligated through the celebration of Pesach and Matzah to pass this knowledge and understanding on to the next generation. And when they ask what this is all about, this is part of our Seder, Exodus 13, verse 8, on that day you're, you're to tell your son, it is because of what Adonai did for me when I left Egypt. The fathers are commanded to teach the children so that the next generation will know the power, the love, and the words of Adonai. If, if we have a generation that does not know God, that means the previous generation did not teach them. And this is a shortcoming we see of Yehoshua, of Joshua. Joshua was a profound man of God. He followed Moses as a loyal number two for 40 years. We talk about this often in leadership. Leadership is slow. It takes time. It has to be nurtured to bring into the fullness of what God wants for us, both men and women as leaders, 40 years. Moses was 80 years before he walked into his destiny. But Moshe had Yehoshua. Yehoshua didn't raise up the next generation. He didn't mentor that next leader. He didn't have someone in the wings ready to take it when he moved on like Moses had with him. That's his shortcoming. It's where Yehoshua, Joshua fell short in Judges 2, who when he died, and when that entire generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation arose that knew neither Adonai nor the work he had done for Israel. This is a critical component, this order in this festival that we must pursue, that we must do, or we will have that generation that we have the beginning seeds of right now, that neither know Adonai or know the mighty works he has done for us. And this goes all the way back. It begins with Father Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 7. He said, I am establishing my covenant between me and you, along with your descendants after you, generation after generation. Here we have it, Lador Vador again, which means a period of generation. And major, this is a major component of obedience to Adonai, is passing along this knowledge, this Torah, this understanding, his word, his commands, his mitzvahs, his rulings. From Lador Vador, from generation to generation, that is how the kingdom of God is kept alive. 
He says this is an everlasting covenant to be God for you and for your descendants after you. It's our relationship with God that we're to pass along generation to generation. This relationship is based upon covenant established with Avram and his descendants as fulfilled in Yeshua, the Passover lamb. The one new man itself is a complex, restorative, transformational foundation of the Messianic movement, which is based upon the covenant relationship passed along generation to generation. We're very excited. We probably have one of the youngest worship teams in the entire movement. You're part of that, Chris, Den. But if we take the average age and put them all together, it's very, very low. We spend a lot of time pursuing and putting into feeding that next generation to mentor them, to bring them up. We, we've got, what, 50-some Kadima talks free online. Our specific target and focus is the young Messianic leaders coming behind us. We don't want any hindrances. We don't want people to have to pay for this. We want to pass what God give to us freely. We pass on freely. The one new man itself is so complex. It's restorative. It's transformational. It's, in fact, foundational to the Messianic movement and Messianic congregations that must be passed on. That covenant is the core tenet of creation, of Torah itself, and the Brahadashah, the New Testament, and even this congregation. In Exodus 12, Adonai commanded, he commanded we celebrate Pesach, Passover, from generation to generation. There is a clear line of ascension between generations based upon the tenets, the words, and the divine calendar of Adonai. Our current Messianic revolution, the Messianic restoration, Messianic revival and restoration is in fact generation to generation. The greater body of Messiah's shortcoming is the failure to carry out Adonai's commands and instructions, to teach his covenant commands and the mitzvahs, which explains why the body is quickly and significantly shrinking and in decline and for the most part powerless and ineffective. Now I shared this Tuesday night at the resurrection service, but a recent Gallup poll published just last Monday states Americans' membership in houses of worship continued to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in 80 years. And that's how long it's been monitored. Below 50%. Just 20 years ago, it was 75%. And the sad part is membership doesn't mean authentic worship and relationship. There's many people that are members of congregations that don't have a relationship with God. So tragically, that number is even lower than what we see in the Gallup poll. Yeshua himself engaged in generation to generation in a radical and transformative manner. It's an interesting side note that in this time there were many well-known religiously trained scholars in Judea that Yeshua could have picked for his Talmudim. The well-known Gamliel. We just got done celebrating our seders. Every Orthodox Seder, even our own Seders, quote Gamliel. 2,000 years later, Yeshua was alive when he is alive. He didn't pick him. He didn't say, hey, sage and man of God, follow me. You had members of the Sanhedrin. You had the high priest. He didn't pick a one of those. He went to the Gen Z of his day. He went to the millennials, the young people generation to generation. And we see this in another Passover parallel story in Matthew 10, verses 1 through 4. Yeshua summoned his 12 disciples, his Talmudim, and gave them authority over unclean spirits so that they could drive them out and heal every kind of disease and sickness. Bam! Dainu! That would have been enough. That alone would have been enough. Verse 2, now these are the names of the 12 emissaries. First Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, Jacob, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, Yaakov, Jacob, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judah, the man from Kuriot, the one who also betrayed him. Yeshua picked 12 nobodies from the country who were identified by their Galilean accent and gave them authority over all unclean spirits so they could drive them out and heal every, every, and all diseases and sicknesses. Not some, but all. This is radical because culture today says you've got to go to cemetery. It says you have to go to yeshiva. You have to have a master's. You have to have a doctorate. Yeshua didn't say that. He picked 12 country boys and said, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. 
And they dropped everything, like Abraham, immediate compliance. We have so far to go to get back to these basic fundamental truths. I shared this with the kingdom. He didn't tell us to build religious structures or doctrine or the Talmud or catechisms or dogma. He said, follow me. And when you do, I will give you authority over every unclean spirit. And you will raise the dead and you will heal the sick. Not some of them, but all of them. And this small group turned the world upside down in just decades, in decades, not hundreds of years, but decades. And 11 of these 12 Talmudim, 11 of the 12 are under 20 years old. One is about 20 or 21, Peter, and Yeshua is somewhere between 30 and 33 years old. And how do I know this? I've shared this once before, but it's so strategic to where we're at right now. Exodus 30, verses 13 and 14, everyone subject to the census is to pay as an offering to Adonai half a shekel, one-fifth of an ounce of silver by the standard of the sanctuary shekel. And by the way, they just found one of these in Israel this week. Digging at, at, at the foundation where the Israel Museum is in the southwest corner, they just found a sanctuary shekel from the Second Temple period. Very, very powerful. Verse 14, everyone over 20 years of age who is subject to the census is to give this offering to Adonai. The temple tax is a required payment for every male over the age of 20 years old. Now let's go to Matthew 17, starting at verse 24. When they came to Kephar Nachum, to Capernaum, the collectors of this half shekel tax, and this is, you know, it's tax time now, right? You're all doing, you're still paying this temple tax. It's a lot more than a shekel these days. <laughs> the collectors of the half shekel came to uh, Peter, Kepha, and said, doesn't your rabbi pay the temple tax? Now, I find verse 25 to be a little presumptuous because he answers for Yeshua's. Well, of course he does. Okay. When he arrived home, Yeshua spoke first. He already knew what had happened. Shimon, what's your opinion? The kings of the earth, from whom do they collect duties and taxes? From their sons or from others? From others, he answered. Then said Yeshua, the sons are exempt. But to avoid offending them, verse 27, go to the lake, throw out a line, take the first fish you catch, open its mouth, and you'll find a shekel. Take it and give it to them for me and for you. Yeshua provided the temple tax for himself and for Peter. But what about the others? It's not required. They're all teenagers. This small group of Yeshua's Talmudim were teenagers. Again, young adults that turned the world upside down under the age of 20 years old. What I've come to understand is that what God is doing through us will not fit into an old wineskin. I don't want yesterday's old religious manna. It's not fresh. It's not relevant. The soon coming messianic outpouring and sovereign move of Adonai cannot be compared to anything that previously or currently exists because there's nothing like it. And we're in this transition right now. Radically. We're at the age of redemption. We're at the messianic reign, the Davidic kingdom with this accompanying glory cloud. We were talking in the office this week. I'm absolutely amazed. And I'm not boasting. But this is what God is doing. We're already in revival. Look at me. We're already in revival. Last year at this time, we were shut down hard. You were watching us online. It looked like it was that night. We, we were recording. We had everything set up in here. But this was empty. There was only two or three camera operators in here and the worship team. And at that time, we were going solely live stream. And we're, we were getting at that time eight to 900 views a month, give or take. And that's everything. That's the Facebook. That's, that's all the services. That's all we're doing. Guess what it was the last month? Now we're live services. The number, we've doubled in size in live services. Last month, over 20,000 views. Not hits, views. 20,000. Listen, it's in the U.S., Ukraine, Germany, France, U.K., Australia, Canada, Singapore, all over the place. Every now and then we get pings from weird countries. It's like, what in the world? Somebody's watching and, you know, where was it? Uruguay. Hola. So what this is, is a revelation that the current of glory, it's in the world now, it's already moving. And it's incumbent upon us to start tapping into this. 
That no longer are we bound by walls. Right? And I've shared this before with kingdom building. As a congregation, we've always kingdom built. All the years we did the outreach up at the Virginia State Fair. Remember just six weeks ago I talked about this. We didn't say, well, now you said the prayer, you got to come here. I don't care where you go. Just go and get fed. Because we're engaged in kingdom building, not congregation building. There's a radical difference in outlook and thought. The Jewish thought is tikkun olam, the restoration of the world. Most Christian thought is build my congregation. Those are radically different philosophies. We're all looking forward to yeast feast tomorrow. You can have your Doritos again, your Rubens, your pizzas. Maybe a donut or two. I don't, maybe the hot sound will be on. You'll have to go check it out. I don't know. On the last days of matzah, we have the ability to receive this divine revelation, to see and experience the supernatural work of God through this feast. The experience allows us to put the finishing touches, the closure on our own exodus from bondage, our own personal redemption and salvation through Yeshua at Passover and unleavened bread, to pursue and seek the awakening of the Ruach on Shavuot. We, the children of Israel, we'd been lived in and enslaved in Egypt for hundreds of years. We had become immersed and imbued and subjected to, infused with Egyptian culture. That's part of the issue we have in a greater body of Messiah today. We've been, in, we've been in the world's wealthiest and richest country for so long that we have forgotten who gave us the power to get that wealth. A generation has arisen who no longer knows the mighty hand of God, the providence of the foundation of this nation and how supernatural and miraculous it is. Because if you look at it statistically in the odds, we shouldn't be here. And it's a parallel story to Israel. Look at the war in 1948. Statistically, it's impossible. Immediately, what, eight or ten nations attacked us. And yet we won! With a bunch of old British Enfields and uh, some Israeli pilots flying biplanes. It doesn't make any sense. We were almost annihilated in the Yom Kippur War of 73. But God, but God. And we have story after story after story of America, but God. And yet now, we're at a point where no, nobody remembers his providence and his hand upon us at our birth. Israel and Egypt had begun to think like Egyptians, including the paganism of Egyptian worship and Egyptians' pantheon of gods. See, we have too many in the body of Messiah today that are living like the world, imbued, infused with the culture of the world. We see the children of Israel in diaspora in Egypt no culture, no vision, no hope. There was absolutely nothing biblical or what would become known as being Jewish about them. The plagues brought us out of physical slavery, but it didn't remove Egypt from within us. The eighth day marked the beginning of kingdom living and the end of being slaves to Pharaoh, but the journey continues. The transition to the kingdom Remember, as Basilius, a royal power, kingship, dominion, rule, the territory subject to the rule of the king of heaven, the reign of the Messiah. Pesach and Matzah are kingdom events. And through Yeshua's death, we had the physical redemption from Egypt, but Egypt was still in here. And if you read now through the book of Judges, you see that generation after generation, it kept rising up, it kept rising up. So we, we have a new event, a new transition 2,000 years ago. Colossians 1, verse 13, it says that Yeshua rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. First we had the physical redemption, then we had the spiritual redemption. When we're redeemed and freed from our previous lives, trapped in the domain of darkness, we're transferred to the Lord's reign, to his kingdom, with his subjects and people. We're citizens. We're subjects of his kingdom in order to do what? To serve, to minister, and to worship the king in all his royal splendor and glory. Passover marks the season of our redemption, physically and spiritually. On the first days, we relive our salvation from Egyptian bondage. And on the last days, particularly on the eighth and the final day, we celebrate the messianic redemption of the world, tikkun olam. The release from all spiritual bondage and servitude we're going back to the future, as it's recorded in Isaiah 11, verses 15 and 16. Then Adonai, remember we started in Isaiah 11. 
And we started about the coming together, Jew and Gentile, Judah and Israel. That doesn't happen until now. So we know that this, this passage is talking to our day today. This is a guidepost in eschatology. Verse 16, then Adonai will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. Does that sound familiar? 3,700 years ago, he did a strong east wind, and we walked across what? On dry ground. He said he's going to do it again. He will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. He will wave his hand over the river with a scorching wind, and he will strike it into seven streams and let men walk over in sandals. So there will be a highway, verse 16, for the remnant of his people who remained from Assyria, as there was for Israel in the day that they had come up out of the land of Egypt. The end is the beginning. The unity of matzah is our destiny. The bonds of fellowship as family are forged when we partake of the unleavened bread equally as one. All divisions and divisiveness are destroyed as we've denied ourselves the chametz of this age, the chametz of this generation, and celebrate with the new as we read tonight in the readings, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8. Get rid of the old chametz. Get rid of the old religion. Get rid of the old ways. That previous generation didn't get to go into the promised land. They died, scattered through the desert. Get rid of that chametz so that you could be a batch of dough because in reality, you're unleavened. Talking about matzah. For our Pesach lamb, the Messiah has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder not with the leftover chametz, the chametz of wickedness and evil, but with the matzah of purity and truth. Paul's redirecting the early believers in Corinth to live a life worthy of the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, Yeshua. The eighth day marks our rebirth as a new creation. Yeshua has given us authority over all unclean spirits so that you and I can drive them out. We can heal every kind of sickness and disease. We can go into the nations and make Talmudim to make disciples. Yeshua proclaimed the kingdom by demonstrating the power, healing all who were brought to him, raising the dead, whereby huge crowds started to follow him. This is the true revival. This is the true awakening. And the current, the undertow, it's already begun. But don't miss the waters. Don't miss the wave when it's coming. The window of the opportunity you've got to take advantage of while that window is open. Once that opportunity is passed, it's gone. The opportunity of a lifetime must be taken in the lifetime of that opportunity. This is the true revival. This is the true awakening, the true path to the age of redemption and the Davidic kingdom. John 14, verse 12, and I shared this Tuesday night as well. Yes, indeed, this is Yeshua speaking. I tell you that whoever trusts in me will also do the works I do. Indeed, he will do greater ones. Do you trust in Yeshua? I mean, really, are you in covenant relationship? Do you trust in Yeshua? Well, then prove it by your fruit. Then start engaging in signs and wonders. Start raising the dead. Start healing the sick. Start praying. Start interjecting yourself into our society, into your workplace, into your school, at Walmart, at the store, wherever you go. We have this power, but we're silent. Or I get the phone call. Rabbi, I've been a Jewish guy. Here's his number. You had him right there. Lay your hands on him. Heal him. Set him free. We are Adonai's agent and work in the same supernatural resurrection power of Yeshua. We are the instrument of his divine resurrection power if we allow it to do what Yeshua commanded to be done. And trust you be this power gets people's attention. When we move in this as a fluid, unified body, you don't have to put a sign out front. You don't have to put ads in a newspaper. You don't have to advertise on the Internet. You don't need a commercial on TV. Because all can see and perceive the glory. When you were in northern Israel 3,500 years ago, and you passed through Shechem, and you got to Ariel, where the Mishkan had become a permanent temple, put on a stone foundation. 
There was no mystery because you could see the pillar of fire all night long hovering over that O.L. Moed. During the day, you could see the cloud hovering. You could see the manifest presence of God. It's how it should be with us. What happened in that upper room in Shavuot? And now, 43 days. What was on him but what? Fire. Fire. The presence of God had manifested upon them, and you could visibly see the presence of God, what looked like tongues of fire upon their heads. That's the goal. That's the pattern. That's what we're striving for. And I believe we, we've begun a transition to get back to the beginning, to go back to our first love. And to not talk about this stuff, to not teach about it, but to literally move in it, to perform it, to do it. To know when you lay your hand on somebody and pray, they will be healed. They will be set free. To plead the blood, to plead the word of God over them and into them, that hearts would be circumcised, that that deutimous power, that resurrection power of Yeshua would move through us. If every one of you in the next week just got one person, just one, the entire Hampton Roads area would be turned upside down. Is this a holiday guilt trip? You bet it is. It's what we're known for. Sheep make sheep. Look at me. Sheep make sheep. The shepherd doesn't do that. And so if anything, as we're coming into the eighth day, I want you to be emboldened. I want you to have this fire over you and in you. The very essence of you should burn for the presence of God. That was David's heartfelt cry. Oh God, don't take your presence from me. Was David perfect? No. Did he sin? Yes. But he knew to repent and to stay in right relationship with Adonai. Without pride or arrogance but with a humble and contrite heart, with clean hands and a pure heart. That's what will start a revolution. Father, right now in Yeshua's name, I'm praying for a release of fresh fire from heaven. Father, I'm praying that every person that desires it would raise their hands and receive it right now in Yeshua's name. As we know, the portals of heaven are open. And I'm praying for a supernatural release of the deutimous resurrection power of the Passover lamb, Yeshua, HaMashiach, to fill every soul, every spirit, to manifest itself in the fruit of the kingdom, that they will make disciples, that they will raise the dead. You gave us the authority already, Yeshua. You've already given it to us. Let us move forward. Let us heal the sick, every disease, no exceptions. Father, we have the power to end COVID tonight, right now. It rests in the palms of our hands. But we've got to rise up and move forward and do it. Decree and proclaim the word of God. To stand in truth, to have trust and know that the creator of the universe is greater than COVID-19. That no weapon formed against us shall prosper. That the kingdom of God is being expanded. The kingdom of God is here. And then we must tell the people, come, it's at hand. Abba, Father, I'm praying for Passover, matzah miracles. Father, we have 43 days to shovel out. Manifest your presence. Let it be stronger each and every day as we count down the omer with anticipation and excitement for you and your presence, for an indwelling. We don't want a visitation, Abba, Father. We want an indwelling. May it start tonight, right now. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen.